Hi everyone. As Jehovah's Witnesses, we were isolated from society. Uh, neutrality was extended beyond political involvement, but also to any kind of social reform or justice uh, activities. The reasoning that I recall being used was why repair a sinking ship? But we were completely controlled by our last day's Armageddon timetable. Scriptures that were used included James chapter 4 about friendship with the world and 1 John 2 about uh, uh, not loving the world. I thought we should maybe read the, the 1 John 2 passage because in context it's not about loving just just loving the world but uh, it's it's about loving the things of the world materialism and and showiness but not about people and and people's interests first John chapter 2 verses 15 and 17 read do not love the world or anything in the world if anyone loves the world the love of the Father is not in him for everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. So I would say in context, it's not telling you that you should not be doing the will of God. What is the will of God? That uh, you're protected from all these things that the world promotes. You're promoting the will of God. I'm going to read to you another little mini bio of, of Victor Shepherds on William Stringfellow from, from his book uh, So Great a Cloud of Witnesses. William Stringfellow lived from 1928 to 1985. Can the, can the Pope speak infallibly? Stringfellow was asked at an ecumenical gathering. His reply was swift and sure. Any Christian who speaks in conformity to the gospel speaks infallibly. It was typical, the pithy pronouncements that would endear him to many. Yet he was ever as profound as he was precise. When Karl Barth visited the United States in 1962, he pointed past the seminary professors to the diminutive lawyer and remarked, this is the man America should be listening to. William Stringfellow was born in Northampton, Massachusetts, Two sets. You know that I have trouble with that one. His father was a knitter in a stocking factory. Needing money for a university education, he held three jobs in his last year of high school, yet managed to gain several scholarships and find himself at Bates College by age 15. Another scholarship took him to the London School of Economics. It was here he was to write later. He learned the difference between vocation and career. Military service followed with the second armored division of the U.S. Army. When other soldiers complained that they were deprived of an identity in the armed forces and couldn't be themselves, he disagreed. He knew that it is the living word of God, Jesus Christ, who gives us our identity and frees us to own ourselves, cherish ourselves, and profoundly be ourselves anywhere. Next was Harvard Law School. While a degree, a degree from this prestigious institution was a key that unlocked many doors, the door on which he knocked was in a slum tenement in Harlem, New York City. He had decided to work among poor blacks and Hispanics and the most marginalized of the metropolis. 
The move from Harvard to Harlem was jarring. His apartment measured 25 feet by 12 feet. The previous tenants had been five children and three adults. The kitchen contained a tiny sink and an old refrigerator, neither of which worked, an old gas stove, a bathtub, and a seatless toilet bowl. Thousands of cockroaches were on hand to greet him. Then, said Stringfellow, I remembered that this is the sort of place in which most people live in most of the world for most of the time. Then I was home. Stringfellow's chief legal interests pertained to constitutional law and due process. Both were dealt with every day as he represented victimized tenants, accused persons who would otherwise have inadequate counsel in the courts, and impoverished black people who were shut out of public services like hospitals and government offices. Knowing that his lord had touched the untouchable lepers, he represented those who belonged to the George Henry Foundation, sex offenders whom no other lawyer would assist. Throughout his student days, Stringfellow had involved himself in the World Christian Student, Student Federation. Now he was as d deeply immersed in the World Council of Churches, not to mention the turbulence of his own denomination, the Episcopal Anglican Church of the U.S. Friends insist he was never more eloquent than the night he stood up, uninvited in the Anglican Cathedral in Washington, and pleaded with his denomination to ordain women to the priesthood. He appeared not to be heard. Frustration with the church was not new to him. Upon moving to Harlem, he had joined the East Harlem Protestant Parish, enthused by its stated commitment to honoring the witness of scripture and the vocation of the laity. Within 15 months, he concluded with sadness that once again the Bible had been silenced and the laity, laity, laity submerged. East Harlem Parish, like most churches in North America, was clergy-controlled uh, preserve of shallow leftist ide ideology. Meanwhile, denominational authorities refused to use the confirmation class book he had been commissioned to write. The realism of Instead of Death was too startling. His beloved poor in Harlem continued to mirror him the engagement of the Word of God with human anguish. What sophisticates the suffering of the poor, he wrote, is the lucidity and straightforwardness with which it bespeaks the power and presence of death among men in the world. All men and women, he had learned from scripture that apart from the resurrected one, death is the ruling power of this world, corrupting and crumbling everything its icy breath corrodes. And from this point, this power of death, no man may deliver his brother, nor may a man deliver himself. His frustration with seminaries was inconsolable. Liberal schools of theology had disdained the Bible, offered little more, more than poetic recitations, social analysis, gimmicks, solicitations, sentimental sentimentalities and corn. Fundament fundamentalist institutions, on the other hand, had yet to learn that, if they actually took the Bible seriously, they would inevitably love the world more readily, because the Word of God is free and active in the world. As often as the seminarians shunned him, students at the law schools and business schools of major American universities heard him eagerly. They were aware that he knew just how the world turned and who or what makes it turn. 
So it was that he was equally comfortable practicing law on behalf of those who could not afford to pay, delivering a guest lecture at Columbia University Law School, or preaching the good news of deliverance and reconciliation among church people across America. Church people who had no grasp of the deadly, deep, dyed racism he lived with every day. Fourteen books poured from his pen, as well as dozens of articles in both theology and law. Raging diabetes eventually overtook him. When he died, a distraught Daniel Berrigan, a, Ju a Jesuit anti-nuclear protester to whom Stringfellow had afforded sanctuary, could only say, He kept the word of God so close, and in such wise that its keeping became his own word and its keeping. Jim Wallace, the leader of the Sojourners community in Washington, where Stringfellow had spoken frequently, summarized the lawyer's life. In his vocation and by his example, he opened up to us the word of God. I'm going to close with another scripture text about the world. John 17 verses 13 to 18. It's, it's uh, the Lord's Prayer concerning his disciples. Uh, so it's John 17 verses 13 to 18. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. So Jesus was sent into the world, and he sends his disciples into the world to do God's will. I'm going to link to two videos. One is uh, one that was uh, based on Ray Francis' book, In Search of Christian Freedom. Can JW's Really Love Neighbor in the Governing Body's Closed Society? And the second one was Jesus, Friend of the Common People.